Hi, everybody. Welcome to lecture 17 in our series on the trivium, that is, the first three of the classical liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Today, we press on in our discussion of the logic of arguments. Last time, we looked at the relation between deductive logic and inductive logic, uh, and we'll be continuing today with the former of those, deductive logic, and looking at the structure, specifically, of the syllogism, the so-called categorical syllogism. Let's dive into it. This is the only appropriate Google image that I found for the word syllogisms. I think it's kind of nice because indeed what is happening in a syllogism is you have, well, here you have three gears. Um, in the case of a syllogism, you have three propositions, two terms and a conclusion, or two premises and a conclusion um, that are yielding new knowledge. And that is what arguments are all about. Let's think a little bit more about arguments. Um, there are two kinds of deductive arguments. So here we're using the division of terms again. Um, so we're first distinguishing between deductive arguments and inductive arguments, and we're looking only at these, deductive. And then within deductive arguments, there are arguments built with categorical propositions. That's A, I, E, O, the four kinds that we've looked at in earlier lectures, and arguments built with hypothetical propositions. Um, and we've introduced those a little bit already. They're if-then propositions or um, propositions that join multiple categorical propositions with either and or or. Today, we're looking at only, again, the first kind of those. Arguments built using categorical propositions. This is the basic kind, and this will enable us to create what is called a syllogism, or I should say construct what is called a syllogism. Um, in a later lecture, we're going to look at building arguments using hypothetical propositions. That's coming up. So I think this is, this is an interesting topic this week because it pertains to a lot of arguments that you hear everywhere on the internet, uh, in life, right? Talking to people. You can always ask, it should say two questions about any argument. You can ask, is the argument valid? Or you can ask, is the argument sound, right? Validity is about whether the conclusion follows from the premises. It's about the rules of logic, right? So I start with premise one, and I give premise two, and is it true, is, is it a valid inference to say that the conclusion is true, right? There are certain rules that pertain to this. The second question you can ask is, is it sound? And this question is, are the premises true? Well, to determine that, you might have to open your eyes and get out of your chair and walk into the world and determine whether you think a certain premise, a certain proposition taken as part of the argument is in fact true. You might need to observe things. You might need to gather evidence in support of it, right? And so thus we open up this whole network of argumentation that is um, civil society. Uh, if the argument is both valid, that is the conclusion follows validly from the premises, um, and it is sound, that is the premises are actually true, then the conclusion will be true, right? So just to hammer the point home, propositions, that is each line in the syllogism, right? Each statement um, is either are either true or false. They are claims about the world. I need to get out of my chair. I need to go look at some things. But arguments themselves, taking the whole syllogism together, are only valid or invalid. And that is based on their structure. So I can have lots of true claims but I could draw an invalid conclusion from those. And that would mean that something went wrong with my reasoning, even if everything I'm starting from is true. Or I can make a perfectly valid, even a compelling argument based on false claims, right? <laughs> Certainly that's something that we too often see in our world. Um, that's my editorializing. Um, we can also distinguish between arguments that are constructed synthetically or analytically. On the slide, we have this. If we start with premises and try to argue to a conclusion, we call this arguing synthetically because we're synthesizing, we're bringing together the different propositions that are serving as premises in the argument, and we're getting from those some new knowledge, a conclusion, right? So if I have this piece of evidence and this piece of evidence and this piece, and I put them all together, I say, therefore, this follows from those, from those premises. 
The alternative is to argue analytically. If we start with a conclusion, we can try to figure out what premises lead to that conclusion. Uh, as Kant would say, what are the conditions of the possibility of this conclusion, right? So in that case, you'd be trying to say, maybe writing an essay or something like this, right? And you start from a certain thesis, then you want to take apart and show uh, what are the premises, what are the uh, pieces of evidence that support that conclusion. All right. A syllogism has a standard order, and I probably should have capitalized order. This is one of those terms that's kind of a, a standard term in logic, the standard order of the syllogism, right? So here it is again, friends, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, our classic example. Let's take a look at each of these. So this is a categorical proposition. All men are mortal. It is functioning in this context of this argument as a premise. It is our first premise. This is also a categorical proposition. Socrates is a man. S is P. Right? Um, this is functioning also as a premise in the context of this argument. So these are my two premises and the line indicates that we're moving from premises to the conclusion. Um, also, the word therefore indicates that. Usually, therefore is the word used to indicate when you come to a conclusion. That's the conclusion. <laughs> okay, so this, this is our 101 level here, right? They're, they're all three of them are propositions, but the first two are functioning as premises, and the last one appears as the conclusion. Now, let's take this apart a little more. A syllogism, um, again, when it's in its standard order, has a certain structure. So first, you want to find what is called the subject term. And there's a very easy rule of thumb for this, friends. The subject term in a categorical syllogism is always the subject of the conclusion. Right Here, our conclusion is, therefore, Socrates is mortal. We know from our discussions of grammar earlier on that Socrates is the subject of that sentence slash statement slash proposition, right? Socrates is the subject. Um, and it appears in the second premise. So the subject term is also called the minor term. Um, and the minor term appears in the minor premise. Or we should say, in whichever premise the minor term appears, that premise is the minor premise. So subject term and minor term are synonyms. They mean the same thing. They're just different terms for the same thing. Uh, and whichever premise the subject term appears in is called the minor premise. The predicate term, uh, um, symbolized by the letter P, we can again find by looking at the conclusion. Here it is the predicate of the conclusion. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. S is P. Mortal is the predicate term. Uh, this is also called the major term, and it's called so because it is more general than the minor term. The minor term Socrates is just one individual, but the major term mortal pertains to everything that is mortal. So it's rather larger in its scope. And we can find the predicate term in the premises above, um, and the premise in which we find it is called the major premise, because this is the major term. In this case, it is the first premise, all men are mortal. Right? So it appears in the major premise, and it appears as always the predicate of the conclusion. This is the secret sauce, the key factor, the key term, right? The middle term, because somehow we need to establish that the conclusion is true. That is, that this predicate, mortality, can be truly said of Socrates, that Socrates is in fact mortal. We need to connect those two, Socrates and mortality, right? How is that being done? Well, it's being done through the middle term. I remember we had some discussions earlier of immediate inference. Those were cases where you could derive an, a new proposition from an original proposition without a middle term. In an argument, we do use a middle term. And this is an extra tool in our toolbox and enab enables us to do uh, far more than, than simply immediate inference. Uh, enables us to do. Here we have immediate inference, right? So the middle term is man or men, the um, 
the uh, what would you say the, the singularity or plurality of the term I can't think of the term for that um, doesn't uh, matter in this case although that's an that's an interesting question um, so let's say the middle term here is men um, the middle term is going to mediate between the minor term represented by the letter S and the major term represented by the letter P to give us new knowledge and that new knowledge is Socrates is mortal we didn't know that starting out with just the first two premises we had to perform this operation we had to actually build the argument in order to reach that conclusion notice that the middle term appears in both the major premise and in the minor premise so that is the thing that is stitching together that that is the egg in the cake Right? That, that is the thing that's holding together the conclusion uh, and, and bringing together the two premises to create new knowledge. Uncover new knowledge, maybe. Um, thank you to the creator of this image. This will, I hope, help to hammer the point home. Here we have a different example, an interesting argument. All scientists are biased. All engineers are scientists. Therefore, all engineers are biased. I think this is a useful example because it, it reminds us of how important it is that the premises we're using are specific and clear, right? So all scientists are biased. I mean, that could either be an expression of deep skepticism about the scientific profession, um, or it could be simply stating that all human beings are speaking from a certain perspective or situationality, uh, and therefore they have a certain bias. Um, so we need to look at each of these premises in terms of their truth value, um, but what we're looking at here is simply the argument itself, and this is, as it stands, a valid argument. The minor term is the subject S of the conclusion. In this case, it is engineers, and it appears in the minor premise, which is the second one. All engineers are scientists. Uh, the major term, uh, biased, is what is being predicated of engineers in the conclusion. That is the uh, predicate term symbolized by P uh, and appears in the um, first uh, premise here. All scientists are biased. And scientists is our middle term appearing here in gray italics. Uh, and that's what's, again, the egg in the cake that is stitching together the major term and the minor term to yield the conclusion, to give us new knowledge. There are two other ways of analyzing a uh, uh, syllogism, uh, and uh, we'll come to these a little bit later in the series, although the series is quickly wrapping up, um, when we talk about trying to determine the, the, the validity of arguments. Uh, it'll be important in that case to be able to figure out uh, what is the figure of a syllogism and what is so-called mood of a syllogism. So we'll conclude uh, this brief lecture with some remarks on each of those uh, two features of uh, a syllogism. So the standard order is what we've been reviewing, right? You have the premise, premise, conclusion with the minor term, the major term, and the middle term kind of lined up in the way that we've seen. Um, but we can actually put together a syllogism in other ways. Um, in those other ways, each of those ways is called a figure. Uh, and there are, according to Aristotle and uh, many after him, four possible figures of the categorical syllogism. Four different ways, that is, of putting in order the subject term, the predicate term, and the middle term. Uh, and that is indicated on the following chart, uh, helpfully provided for us by Hauser in his book, Logic as a Liberal Art, to which I am forever grateful. Uh, here we have a figure one syllogism, uh, and then two, three, four. So we're running across the rows. Um, in the case of a figure one syllogism, well, that's what we've been looking at as it happens. Uh, the major premise, you begin with the middle term and then have the predicate term. The minor premise presents the subject term and then the middle term. And the conclusion in all four cases, you will notice, always uh, first states the subject term and then the predicate term. So in all four figures, the conclusion is always uh, S and P, right? Um, middle meaning M, P for predicate, S for subject. So in the case of all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, um, we have a figure one syllogism. We can take a look at that. The middle term is men, the predicate term is mortal, and the subject term is Socrates. So we have at the top of our chart here, figure one in the major premise, all men, middle term, are mortal, predicate term. Uh, in the minor premise, Socrates, 
subject term, is a man, uh, middle term. Therefore, Socrates, subject term, is mortal, predicate term. So that is a figure one syllogism. But there can be, and we will see examples of it later in the course, um, three other kinds of uh, uh, figures of syllogism. Finally, we have an, a pretty straightforward um, determination you can make about a syllogism. It's mood, right? So a syllogism has a mood. The figure was about the order of the terms, how the subject and predicate and middle term appear, the order in which they appear. But the mood is about its quantity or quality. That is the quantity or quality of each of the uh, propositions included, the premises and, and the conclusion, right? You designate the mood using the letters that we've learned for the different kinds of propositions. So you have an A or an I proposition, that's a universal or particular affirmative, and you have E and O propositions, which are universal or particular negative, right? Um, each mood for the categorical syllogism has three letters. So I might say, I have an A, A, A proposition. That means that the first premise is an A proposition, the second one is an A proposition, and the third one, the conclusion, is an A proposition. Easy. I might have an A, E, A, or an A, I, A, or you can combine those four letters in any of, well, rather, well, actually a fixed number of ways um, to yield the, uh, the possible moods of a syllogism, um, some of which will be valid and some of which will be invalid. Uh, we determine the letter for each of the two premises uh, and for the conclusion. That's how we get our three letters and see what it looks like. Here are our four types of categorical propositions. Hello again, chart. We spent some time with this earlier in the series. All SRP, universal affirmative, is an A. No SRP, universal negative, is an E. Some SRP, un uh, particular affirmative, is an I. And some S are not P, particular negative is an O. So when you look at each of the propositions functioning as premises or conclusion in the argument you're building, um, you are, are assessing, you are able to um, identify which letter corresponds with each. And we have as an example, thanks to the creator of this image on Google Image Search, all humans are Greeks, all mortals are human, therefore all mortals are Greeks. Here we have at least an unsound argument, uh, seeing as all humans are not Greeks and all mortals are not humans. So we have a doubly false <laughs> premises, at least according to, to my understanding of things. Um, but we do have a, a properly uh, structured argument. We do have a, a minor term or subject term, which is mortals. We do have a major term or a predicate term, which is Greeks. And we do have a middle term, human or humans, which appears in the first two premises. So here we have a false argument that is valid. It is a valid argument. It is a first figure syllogism because of the placement of the M, S, and P terms. And it is an A, A, A syllogism in terms of its mood, since all three of the propositions, all humans are, all mortals are, all mortals are, um, are a propositions. So these are important ways to designate what kind of categorical syllogism you are working with. So now we know how categorical syllogisms are put together and some different ways to identify their structure and, and form. Next time, we'll be looking at assessing the validity of categorical syllogisms and try to understand how they can go wrong in terms of their validity.